Hello everyone, I'm your host Joel Bryce and welcome to another episode of Delta Waterfowl's The Voice of the Duck Hunter podcast. With waterfowl hunting seasons largely complete in the United States and Canada, today we'll shift our attention to cooking. Hopefully you found success and have a supply of ducks or geese stashed away in your freezer to enjoy for the upcoming months. If you're an established hunter and cooker of wild game, you're sure to pick up a few tips from today's discussion. Today's guest is award-winning wild game chef Hank Shaw. Hank is a pro's pro when it comes to wild game cooking, and he will certainly challenge your way of thinking and likely inspire you to take your cooking to the next level. But first, Hank will help me cover an overlooked aspect of wild game cooking, and that's how cooking wild game, and particularly waterfowl, can function as a barrier for some people to go hunting at all. In our last episode, we discussed in detail how hunter numbers have been on a steady decline for decades. To secure the future of hunting, we discussed the importance of attracting a new wave of people to hunting, people without a hunting heritage, people who did not receive the hand-me-down tradition of hunting. When I say that cooking game can serve as a barrier to hunting, I'm referring to the misconceptions that I all too often hear when talking to prospective hunters and even a percentage of established hunters. The first thing that I hear is that wild game meat has an overpowering taste or that it just inherently tastes bad. In fact, I often hear meat from ducks and geese referred to as flying liver. The second thing that I hear is that in order for wild game to taste good, it must be extravagantly cooked. The misconceptions of flying liver and gourmet cooking or bust understandably leave some to wonder if hunting is for them. Let's bring in today's guest, Hank Shaw, to knock down these barriers, and then let's have some fun talking about wild game cooking. How you doing, Hank? I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm fighting the uh, sub-zero temperature here in North Dakota from the polar vortex, but otherwise, it's a great day. I'm fighting the horribly beautiful and calm and sunny weather here in Northern California. It's just dreadful. Yeah. I, I think we all, we all fear, feel for you, but uh, it's been a I super, might, I mom. might have to put on a, a shirt over my t-shirt. Yeah, you might, you might. Yeah. It, it's been a horribly, well, incredibly mild winter here in North Dakota. So we kind of feel like we've gotten a break, but yeah, I, I think I mentioned before it's going to get minus eight for the high, I think tomorrow and certainly on Saturday. So we're tough here, North Dakota tough, as our governor likes to say, so we'll take it. Yeah, yeah. I used to live in uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul, so I'm familiar with that kind of cold. Yeah, it uh, it does uh, sort out the riffraff, that's for sure. Um, Hank, I, I want to, before we jump in here, I have this, it almost feels like a public service announcement. I have to, I'm going to call this therapy. My dog, my yellow lab, who comes to the office with me every day, literally just about died, Um earlier this morning in the office. He was chewing on a rawhide bone and started to choke. I did the Heimlich maneuver. He passed out, all kinds of things. I revived him. I stuck my hand down his throat, dislodged it, and I thought the rest of the day wasn't going to go very well. But uh, he came out of it, and he's doing fine. So watch out for those rawhides. God, that's scary. I'm glad it, uh, glad it turned out all right. Jeez. Yeah, super scary. But uh, here we are. I'm going to persevere. He's happy. And uh, life will go on. So, Hank, you heard my introduction. I suspect it stirs some strong opinions from your mind. I'm guessing, Hank, you've been cooking for a long time, wild game for a long time, but you must have introduced, by default, hundreds of people to wild wild game cooking, haven't you, Hank? I mean, that's the hope. I mean, I've been doing this publicly through my website, Hunter Angler Gardener Cook, for, oh boy, since 2007, so quite a long time now. Uh, And I've written four cookbooks, and I've got a fifth on the way. And one of those cookbooks is specifically designed to deal with what we're talking about today, which is the book, of course, called Duck, Duck, Goose. And uh, I wrote that book in 2013, and it is specifically to puncture the myths that you're talking about. Yeah, and you and I mentioned, you know, we talked about this real quick a few weeks ago when we set up this this call that there there is kind of that misconception, and I'm going to call it a misconception that that the default for cooking wild game is extravagant and it's gourmet, and 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 for me that's not the case. I, I no. would take issue with that actually. Would you? I, I really, yeah, would. yeah, yeah, because uh, the default for game in this country and in Canada 
is the handful or double handful of recipes that you and your family are aware of and have passed down for generations. So it, it, it really isn't extravagance or bust. It is uh, what you're what you're detecting is a more recent, you know, trend uh, pioneered by people, uh, you know, like Scott Laysath, uh, myself. Uh, there are, you know, people like the people who did the L.O. Bean cookbook many years ago. There's been a uh, a resurgence in the awareness that wild game can be cooked extravagantly, and so you, what you're seeing is is quite a lot of people doing that and being very happy with the results. So it can give you the impression that the default is that when in reality, the default is fry it in bacon fat, uh, put it with cream of mushroom soup, or use some sort of tried and true recipe that your family has been doing for, for generations. Like in the case of North Dakota, where you live, there's a dish called Zarnina, which is a duck stew that is, if you really want to do it correctly, is thickened with the duck's blood. It's a very downtown, homey kind of stew in certain, you know, in certain, in certain areas, in certain families, very much like nefla, um, and and that's not gourmet by any means, but it's 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 kind of a, an old, very safe, successful way to cook duck. Gotcha, gotcha. No, it, it's uh, this is right up right up my alley, to be honest with you. And so, Hank, you're probably familiar. I, I know you've been familiar with Delta for, for some time. Oh, yeah. But Delta really has a, oh, an enhanced focus on the future of hunting. Specifically, you know, as I mentioned before, hunter numbers have been on the decline for quite some time, waterfowl in particular, and we're trying to attract new people to hunting. And by new, like I said, it's people that didn't grow up with it. And so what they, all they know is what they hear. And so there are those misconceptions out there. And so I want to spend some time on that. But before we get there, Hank, I want people to get to know you. So, you know, I, I have my version of who Hank Shaw is, but I I was looking at your website, honest-food.net, hunter, angler, gardener, cook. And, and I read the about section and it made me want to ask you more. So you haven't been a wild game chef your whole life. Matter of fact, you had a history in politics. Is that right? I was a, uh, I was a, I'm born in New Jersey. I spent the first 18 years of my life there and I went to undergraduate school on Long Island and I went to graduate school at Wisconsin, go Badgers. Um, (laughs) And I did not pick up hunting until my thirties, as a matter of fact. So I am exactly the kind of person that you're talking about, except I picked it up before anybody started talking about it. I'm kind of the OG adult onset hunter. Um, I've been fishing and cooking fish and, and cooking fish professionally decades and decades longer than I've been doing game, but it's been decades uh, that I've been cooking wild game. So yeah, I was a, uh, I was a, a, a low level chef, um, you know, a line cook and a sous chef. Uh, I started washing dishes. And, and, you know, if anybody out there listening has worked in the restaurant industry, you know that if you can cook and you start as a dishwasher, chances are you're going to get a chance to get on the line at some point or other. And that's that's what happened to me. And I, I got my training there and then left one misfit job for another misfit job, uh, which would be a newspaper reporter. And I was a newspaper reporter for 18 years, primarily covering politics. Um during that time, cooking and gathering wild plants and mushrooms and fishing helped keep me sane until I moved to the Twin Cities in 2002. And I met a guy named Chris Niskanen, whom you may be mm-hmm. familiar with. Yep. Uh, and Niski is the guy who taught me. He was, he was kind of my mentor when it came time to, to, to learn how to hunt. And he um, he would kind of stoke my interest by giving me some of his game and because i knew how to cook and because my background with wild game as a as a diner as an eater stems to what you were talking about right at the beginning of the show which is the the kind of the luxury experience um my first connection to any kind of game meats were in very nice restaurants in the new york city metro area in the in the late 1970s and 1980s so I never had a connotation 
that duck or goose or squab or venison or anything that we can hunt in this country was anything other than top-notch ingredient to cook with. So that's that, that separates me a lot from a great number of other hunters who cook and and a good way to think about where I stand in this in this group of of people who are all trying to improve the way people cook their game is that I I am a a chef who hunts not a hunter who cooks and that's it, it it's a distinction that has a difference I get it I get it so what what fueled your I call I call you one of the crossover people so you you had outdoor interests outdoor skills, you didn't hunt, and you said around 30, if I heard right, you mm-hmm. crossed over into the hunting world. Was that was that a food-based decision, Hank? It was. Um, it was also a decision uh, that, you know, like I said, I was living in the Twin Cities at the time, and, and, and I'm a born fisherman. So there's something about hard water fishing that um, is fun, Kind of like if you've got a shack, but um, there's no way on God's green acre that I'm going to spend the more or less six months of a Minnesota winter fishing through the ice. And so it, it leaves you with not much to do. And Niskanen said, hey, you know, hunting is a way that you can get out and, and be in, in nature and, and do things in those months that you that you're not fishing on actual liquid water. So. uh that was part of it, but absolutely food was a piece of it. I mean, food was probably the majority piece of it because, like I mentioned, I had had fancy French restaurant renditions of Wild Game as a child. And the opportunity to be able to, to do that in my own house uh, and explore on my own really, really lit a fire underneath me. And what did you start hunting out rabbits. of the gate, rabbits, <laughs> perfect. Rabbits and squirrels, rascally uh, rabbits. Yeah, I, the, the the my first ever successful hunt. Uh, I did go with Chris Niskanen into South Dakota to hunt pheasants, but um, I had no experience with a shotgun, so I couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. Uh, my first successful hunt was a squirrel hunt in a woodlot south of the Twin Cities, and I still to this day. The squirrel hunting where I live in, in Northern California is not very good in the sense that all of the best squirrel hunting is on private land and I don't have access to it. But I do dearly love squirrel hunting to this day. Often overlooked. And and we say kind of in the R3 world is that squirrel hunting is probably the easiest form of hunting to teach and the quickest for someone to repeat on their own. But definitely often overlooked. So it's really cool that you started off hunting with squirrels that's you can i don't want to say you can only go up but that's an an often overlooked kind of a a, a, a different style of hunting my uh, duck hunting history is is fairly entertaining however is uh, it <laughs> so yeah i didn't start hunting ducks until i moved here to northern california in 2004 so when i moved here it was my intention to keep hunting rabbits and squirrels and i did do a fair bit of rabbit hunting here but the rabbit hunting here is also kind of sketchy and uh, our desert cottontails that live in this part of the world are a full pound lighter than the ones that lived in Minnesota. So they're very small. In fact, the, the big western gray squirrels are larger. So I'm like, okay, well, I can muddle through this. And then I very quickly realized that, oh, well, if you live near Sacramento, you're going to have to be a duck hunter because it's religion out here. <laughs> and a lot of people outside this state don't know it. But, yeah, this is a duck and goose hunting is a big deal in Northern California. So, okay, I got myself some fishing waders because I didn't really understand the difference at the, at the time. Um, I used my 20-gauge over and under shotgun, which is what I've been hunting with, and to this day I still love that gun. And I kind of started wandering through public refuges, and I am sorry to anybody I walked in on, uh, of the, which there was probably a good dozen over the couple, first couple of years of, oh, sorry, I walked in on your decoys. Uh But I taught myself how to hunt just by being out there and by observing and by figuring things out with no mentor. And that was an enormous, enormously difficult thing to do. Um, And it it feels good to be able to to do this solo now, all these years later, 
in a way that I would say that if you were to ask me which style of hunting I'm best at, it would be duck and goose hunting. Well, you, t- you taught yourself, right? And that's, that doesn't happen that often. I, I, for me, you know, for those that have listened to this before, I am the textbook hand-me-down recipient of hunting. My grandfather, my dad, myself, my brothers, my kids. But I've always admired people that, for whatever their motivation, took to hunting on their own. And I, I guarantee you, Hank, your your early years of hunting were probably not easy, but you had the motivation to overcome those obstacles. And hey, I've, I've watched you on, I've, I've followed you on Instagram here, and I see that you're having success. So you've got it figured out and, and congrats on, on all that. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, let's get to know you a little bit more. Um, I do, you know, you've given us your time. And so I want to make sure that people get an opportunity to, when this is over, to check out your cookbooks, check out your website, check out your podcast. And and so to start, your website is called Hunter Angler Gardener Cook, correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. And the easiest way to get to it is uh, through the URL huntgathercook.com. That will get you to the to the right website. Gotcha. Great. And, and I've looked at it. It's pretty awesome. You have a podcast. I saw there were about 40-ish episodes called Hunt, Gather, Cook. Do I have that right? Hunt, Gather, Talk. Hunt, Hunt, I'm Gather, sorry. Talk. Hunt, Gather, and, Talk. That's right. Um, I do it as a seasonal thing. So the first season is kind of a little bit of everything. The second season was all about small games. So everything... Uh, not waterfowl, and not big game. And then uh, we're going to restart for season three in the springtime, and I think I'm going to be doing some deep dives into what we're talking about today, which is wild game cooking. Okay, sounds good. And then you you have some awesome cookbooks. Your first one, which I personally don't have, I have a couple others, but your first cookbook was Hunt, Gather, Cook, Finding the Forgotten Feast, and that was uh, all-inclusive some fish, some small game, some big game. Is I don't have that book, and, but that's what I could tell. And gathering right? the wild edible plants, too. Okay, and that was your foray into wild game cooking. That spawned, from what when I look at it, I call it guild-specific. And so what I mean by that is ducks and geese, um, and then you have hooved critters, and then you have other types of small game. So the first one was after that was Duck, Duck, Goose, right? It, it was, yes, okay. in 2013. Okay, and I have it. Listen. Okay, that's your cookbook. <laughs> okay. And then you moved into Buck Buck Moose, and I'm wearing that T-shirt. That's pretty neat. Thank you very much. And then this this is this one. Okay, you saw it on the, on the podcast or heard it on the podcast. And then you moved into Pheasant Quail Cottontail, and let's flag this for everyone too. You have a pre-order in process for your next book. I do. Uh, the, the, I'm finally getting to Fish and Seafood, my first love. And that book is called Hook, Line, and Supper. And that one comes out very soon. It actually should be on the shelves in May. Okay. And they can pre-order through your website, or is there somewhere else that they can go as well? Kind of everywhere you want to get a book, you can pre-order it. Um, the advantage, if you go to my website and pre-order Hook, Line, and Supper, you will get a signed copy. Nowhere else can you get that. <laughs> go for it, I say. One of the, I, I mentioned this just a minute ago. When I, when I said that you have, you've intentionally focused your your subsequent after the first cookbook they all have a focus what's the what's the thought process behind that is it the way certain types of game are processed or or it's they're all relative they're all buckets that fit together well with each other uh, whether it's through cultural practices or culinary practices so so imagine hunt gather cook the first book as kind of your primer for everything that that follows it and because, like we, like we just talked about, um, duck and goose hunting is probably the style of hunting that I'm the most skilled at, uh, if you just put me by myself. And I also, I also realized that of all of the game meats that we eat in North America, waterfowl is probably the most abused. It's the, it's the set of animals that are the most you know, poorly cooked by everybody uh, for a number of reasons that we're going to about to get into. And then when I, when I got done with that book, then obviously you got to do a venison book. Yeah. Right. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and cause I, I try to shoot at least one deer a year and typically more than one um, or deer like thing, you know? 
I shot a nail guy in Texas this year. I was pretty happy with that. Wow. Um, and then the style of hunting that I, I love the most because of its diversity is general small game hunting, uh, upland birds, rabbits and squirrels. Uh, I, I love the environment that that puts you in every bit as much as I do the marsh. And I love the diversity of animals and flavors that you get in the, in the greater small game world, which is why I focused last season's podcast on it. Okay. Awesome. Hey, so Delta is a waterfowl organization. You love exactly. waterfowl hunting. What are mm-hmm. some of the, like you said, waterfowl are some of the more commonly abused types of game meat. What are some of the positives and perhaps negative traits of waterfowl when you're talking about cooking? Diversity is, is probably the first thing that comes to mind because the only other uh, bucket of animals that gives you that kind of diversity in terms of size, shape, and flavor is the, is the small game bucket. So the, you'd have to include all of the upland birds to have the same diversity that you would with waterfowl. So as you know, anybody listening to this knows that a spoonie is very different from a canvas back, which is very different from a Canada goose, which is very different from a speckle belly goose, which is very different from a brant. And a brant on the West Coast is very different from a brant on the East Coast. So you have this diversity of species. You have this diversity of diet. And you have this diversity of diet within region. So, for example, gadwall, south of where I live in the, in the grasslands, are not very good to eat. They're typically called gagwalls there. <laughs> but... but Gadwalls north of where I live in the rice country are amazing birds. So that is both a plus and a minus because you have to really kind of learn which species uh, are never going to do you wrong. You have to learn which species are good in any given area. And then you have to learn which species like "Mm," either don't shoot them or skin them. And it's very much an analog to the heavy, um, entry cost of duck hunting gear guns decoys waders a place to hunt if you don't have a lot of public land Uh, it's a it's a big nut to get into if you're going to be a duck hunter it's also a big nut of knowledge that you have to get into if you're going to be a good waterfowl cook because there are amazing things that you can coax out of virtually all of these animals if you if you understand them well yeah, you, you you've done a good job summarizing my experience. You know, you you know we've we talk here around the office about you know if we if we take breast of duck from various species, cook them with the exact same method in the exact same pan, and then do a taste test. Most of the time, they taste the same. Every once if in a while, they're you do skinless. Get, yeah. Oh, if okay. they're skinless. Okay, that's a good distinction. Now we're talking probably about fat. Is that right? When we're talking of about course, the skin? Yeah. So I could feed you a skinless golden eye breast and a skinless pintail breast. And the only major difference between the two of those is going to be color. The, the golden eye will always be darker. And other than that, if I blindfolded you, you would probably have a hard time telling the difference. I could even do a skinless coot breast in there. And you'd know it because of its size, but it tastes pretty much like neutral red meat if it's cooked properly in the same way as something else, the skin, the skin and the fat are the, are, are the essence of the differences that we're talking about. Okay. So that's where the, you are what you eat comes into play. hundred percent. Okay. I, I do want to give some props to your cookbook, um, obviously in general, but there are a few specifics in there. I'd like at least the two that I have on the front end, you do discuss, Field, you don't talk about how to put, how to gut or how to skin, but you talk about field prep as it or field care as it relates to later on consuming that meat. But you also talk about different cuts, different methods. You also talk about, you know, tell tell me the the sexy word for for entrails for oh giblets giblets <laughs> yeah okay and 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 so yeah so in the waterfowl you know cookbook. Duck, duck, goose, I, I love. You know, you have the gizzard and you have... What else is in there for, for waterfowl? So there are three main... I mean, giblets it, writ large means uh, heart, liver, and gizzards. Now, I would include um, duck tongues as well. And those are kind of weird and, and out there. And, and, and the dish I have for them is very chef So 
that's not going to be in the purview of most people, but everybody can find a use for the liver, heart, and gizzard. I guess you just have, some people just have to get over it. Yeah. I mean, a heart is just meat and a gizzard is just meat. I mean, it's just, it's at the very least, put them into your grind. You will not notice a difference. It's just more meat. I mean, think about it. Everybody out here is getting ready to go snow goose hunting. Do you know that the size of a snow goose gizzard can be the same weight as a hen teal plucked and gutted? <laughs> yes, yes. It's an enormous amount of meat that is just like, I don't care if you eat it as a gizzard, grind it. And then you have more You have more meat. You waste less. I, I do think you fall into the, the stereotype buckets. One pickled gizzard or, or I, I don't know. It, it's just the fact that it's got some people, entrails and people have trouble with that. But you're right. It's organ meat and, and it's largely no different than the rest let's yeah, I mean, liver's different y- yeah mean, different texture yeah flying so liver I'm not, but... I'm not a huge fan of livers for liver's sake except except when you find uh and you find this only in waterfowl in my experience although actually that's not true i found it in turkeys every once in a while um you'll find a fatty liver so not as huge as a foie gras that you get in a in a restaurant but it will be light tan so if, if you're listening to this and you ever get a duck or a goose and the, you pull the liver out and it's light tan, not dark burgundy, that's a treasure because that light tan means it's full of fat. And then when you sear it, kind of medium-ish, so it's still vaguely pink in the center, it will be amazing. And this is coming from a guy who hates liver. <laughs> Breaking down barriers. That, that's a good segue. Uh, organ meat, use it. So there, there's two, I want to take, I want to talk about barriers because again, in the world of, of bringing new people to hunting and, and honestly, even existing hunters, there are myths, there are misconceptions or oversubscribed generalities about uh, game meat tasting poorly, in particular waterfowl. So I want to break this discussion and our goal here is honestly, Hank, it's to remove barriers, wild game meat waterfowl it, it, it's awesome so we want everybody to enjoy this and and run to it happily the first kind of group that i want to discuss are non-hunters that are considering taking up hunting and there's two ways that i want to break down that discussion the first one is taste and the second one is time and this is a very practical discussion hank where you know you hear you know, about the locavore movement. And it's basically a movement of people trying to source, I don't know, organic seems to be overword, over overused, but they're trying to source their food within a local distance. They're looking for self-reliance for some. They're looking for hormone-free for some. Of course, you can buy domestics, but tell me about, in your opinion, Hank, why hunting? Why source wild game meat if you're a locavore? Or want to be? Well, I mean, the, the the well, number one, it's been illegal to buy and sell real wild game for a century. So if you want real wild game, as opposed to what I call game meats, which would be a farmed version of wild game, like farmed elk or, or farmed duck. Um, although farmed duck and goose will, will falls into a quite a different category because, you know, a Pekin duck or Muscovy duck or a Moulard or any of the other meat ducks or geese, they've gone so radically different from a store-bought that they're not really quite the same animal. <laughs> Whereas, you know, farmed elk is vaguely similar to, to, to wild elk. Well, I think, so that's yeah, but I think also, Hank, you kind of mentioned it there, but, you know, there's an organic movement, right? You can buy vegetables, you know, that are certified, certified organic, and you can do the same thing with domestic animals. But Again, why hunting? Why well, the source? The hunting aspect comes in because everything tastes better when you work for it. You know, virtually everybody here has gone fishing at some point, and you have caught a fish and you've ate that fish that day. That fish, no matter how you cook it, unless you've completely destroyed it, uh, will taste better than any fish that you eat at home on a Tuesday. It just does. And there's some hard wiring within us that that's the reward for the work that you have just done. So the, the food, food, you know, caught, not bought, uh, is always going to have an extra layer of meaning to it. And 
that me- that meaning is real. It's something physical. It's something visceral. And most of us spend our days looking at computer screens and the the need for the real is real and the people who get into hunting to think that they want to be a part of it typically they get hooked by that for lack of a better term visceral nature that when you're hunting very much different from fishing but if you're hunting you are in the moment 100 percent because if you're not you're not hunting whereas in fishing you can slip out of the moment, drink a beer and have a conversation. And if your rod bends, then you can be back in the moment. That's not true with duck hunting. With duck hunting, if you slip and you start, I mean, everybody here knows, like I'm going to guess that about 95% of the people listening to this are duck hunters. So how many times have you picked up decoys and a duck flies by, or you've gotten out to take a piss and a duck flies by, or you, you light up a cigarette or you eat saltines. There's, there's a moment where you've left the moment and the ducks can a feel that and b oh you just missed your chance <laughs> so i mean there's that there are so few experiences that people can have in this day and age that are that real and that are that in the moment and people people like doing that you know the take home word on that to me hank and you said it is connection you know if if you're if you're focused on that organic experience you're not going to feel that connection buying organic meat. You're only going to feel that connection through meat that you source yourself. Yeah. I mean, and the other thing is if you are a cook, if you know how to cook, and if you've been exposed to some of these particular animals, there is nothing, nothing like a West Coast brand. There is nothing like a woodcock. There is nothing like a, a canvas back that's been eating wild celery. Like the, 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 you cannot buy these flavors and they're so far superior to anything that you can get in even the finest restaurant in the world that there's an absolute sense of satisfaction when you sit down to a well, a nicely cooked canvas back at your kitchen table on a Wednesday night that like, ha ha, very few people in the world are eating this good tonight. Connection and quality. Mm-hmm. The, the next subject, so for, for still staying in this non-hunter bucket, someone who's considering taking up hunting, I also look at people who are more focused, and I, and I know these people, nice people, but they're focused on their attraction to hunting or considering hunting is through sport or time with friends. They've received an invite, but they look at hunting – they're intimidated by it because they know that if they're successful, they have meat they're going to have to take home. And they see that as intimidating or a burden or what am I going to do with this? What, what are your thoughts on that, Hank? I mean, obviously, we can point them to your cookbook and say, follow this. But I, I, would, I would imagine you would encourage people not to be intimidated by that. Yeah, but I understand it because when you go to the supermarket and you buy something wrapped in plastic, you just rip the plastic off and put it on the pan. And which is why you see the vast majority of hunters of any kind take the equivalent route to the kitchen, which is normally to say skin everything. And that's fine. At least you're eating it. And I'm not going to think you're a bad person if you skin all your ducks. But I would never do that because it's, you've, you've removed what's special. Now, okay. We talked to this person who has just now started hunting and he's into it. You know, he's like, yeah, man, I want to have that. So you have to give them some guidelines to not have a bad experience. So let's say they go hunting with their friends and they come home with, I don't know, five ducks. And three of those ducks, eh, let's just say they're like, yeah, not the best ducks in the world, like golden eyes or buffle heads or, or spoonie. And then they've got two wood ducks. You need to tell that guy take the time to pluck those two wood ducks and skin the other three, because that's the way he's going to have the best experience. You're going to relieve him of some of the burden of plucking. Well, because let's face it, plucking is a skill that, that can only get so fast. Like I'm very good at it. And, and it takes me a little while to, to do each duck. So you want to give people a, um, a a ramp, uh, an increasingly steep ramp of to get this kind of enjoyment. You just got to do this. 
which is to say, if you got a bunch of skin duck breast, just don't overcook them. Then, you know, oh, well, these wood ducks, or these pintails or these speckle belly geese, you want to pluck them because they're worth your time. And then there's like layers and layers and layers and layers on that that you can go in terms of getting more and more enjoyment out of the birds that you bring home. But it can start with very easily. If I'm going to give you a half a dozen skinned mallard breasts, cook them like a steak. Do not cook them past medium. That's the easiest thing. And then they can go from there. So I'm picturing some people trying to write things down because hopefully, yeah, you're right. 95% of our listeners are certainly waterfowl hunters. I'm also certain that they hunt other things, but hopefully there's some new people that this was their first fall and they're like, holy cow, Hank's throwing me some really good nuggets here and I can't remember it. Sure, you can pause and replay it, but how would you guide people to obtain this knowledge? Where, where would they go? What's your advice? I mean, honestly, it's the website. Like Hunter Angler Gardener Cook has been doing this kind of stuff since 2007. I have tutorials on everything. Everything from how to pluck a duck, how to skin a duck, how to render duck fat, how to cook a duck breast, how to cook duck legs, how to, how to duck, cook duck wings, how to cook giblets. You know, this is what I do. And uh, we have YouTube videos and, and articles on the website. And it's just the, the knowledge is out there, whether it's for me or anybody else. And, and I really do honestly think, though, if you're talking about a new hunter, the existence of a friend or a mentor is really, really helpful because human to human knowledge and human to human teaching is so much more effective than anything you can get out of a book or, or online that you can cement truths way easier when it's a person talking to a person. Agreed. Agreed. I, I had a story that kind of came to mind is that, you know, obviously, like I said before, grew up in a hunting family, waterfowl, turkeys, deer, pheasants, you name it. My mom had one recipe for ducks and it was all orange something and I didn't like it. And so to have the option, you know, have resources that, that you can find to, you know, to find that recipe, that taste that pleases your palate and, and to mix it up a little bit. Cause I think most people like diversity in their taste. And, and so I like that you pointed people to your, to your website I pointed people to your cookbook, and I'm going to give that one another two thumbs up. The other category, when we're talking about barriers, and this one's kind of a little different, Hank. This isn't really about taste, kind of. It, this is the already a hunter crowd, and I have run into lots of people like this. They are overscheduled, or only one person in the family eats game. And so what are your thoughts on how to incorporate game into the entire household or quickly incorporate it into the household? Well, I mean, the easy answer is always to grind it. Um, ground meat is ground meat. I mean, there's this great expression in East Africa and Swahili called wanyama ni nyama tu, which translates into all meat is meat. So <laughs> you, you, can, you can grind anything with pork fat or bacon ends and Everybody, everybody who eats meat will eat it, period, end of story. Like, that's by far the easiest way to do things. Um, other ways is to just have some basic knowledge. The reason why most people don't like game is because the other people in the household have not had good game yet. Like, I defy anyone to, I mean, who obviously who eats meat. I defy anyone who eats meat to dislike a properly cooked duck breast. Like you just not, it's just not possible. It's a, it's a steak with a hat made of bacon. And who doesn't like that? <laughs> you know, and the, another idea is to shred. So you cook the, the living crap out of something and you shred the meat off the bone and then you serve it however you like your shredded meat, whether it's like barbecue or Mexican barbacoa or carnitas or, you know, or whatever, whatever. And I think the biggest barrier that non-game eaters have uh, is a um, a fear of it being weird and a fear of it looking weird because because food has to think good as well as taste good. So for a great example is tongue, like with deer or, or moose or, or beef even. So tongue is a phenomenal. It tastes amazing. I, I do, there's nobody listening to this right now that if I handed you a taco de lengua, you know, a chopped, seared, 
braised tongue taco that you wouldn't be, oh my God, this is the best thing I've ever had because it doesn't look like a tongue. But if I hand you a plate with a big old tongue sticking on it, very few people are going to want to eat it because it's weird and gross looking. So people can get hung up on a whole duck or a whole dove or, you know, piece of meat on a bone. And, you know, it's not for me to criticize that person, but it is there. It's everybody's got their hangups. So to make it as generic as possible is a good way to break down barriers. Now, in terms of the speed, because you, know, you mentioned that as well, that's what we get. That's what I just mentioned with the newcomer as well. There are some cases where like, yes, you need to spend the time on this. Now you should know that let's say you, let's say you're an experienced hunter and you got that bag. You got a couple of divers, a spoonie and two wood ducks. This is the example I gave before. So in that case, you're just going to breast or skin out your, your three lesser ducks right away. And that takes, takes almost no time at all. My advice would be to lift that breastplate and grab the giblets as well. Cause it takes an extra 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you're like, Oh, the wood ducks are special. I'm going to pick those now. Okay. You don't have time that night. Put them in a plastic bag in the refrigerator. They'll be fine for a couple of days. Seriously. Holing in the feathers. They'll be fine. And then make some time in the next 48, 72 hours to pick those ducks because they're worth it. And those ducks and, and a good mallard and a good pintail, those are other examples of, of ducks that will never steer you wrong. You know, speckle belly goose, geese will never steer you wrong. Of limiting your time spent in prep to that which is going to give you the best reward. That's an important distinction there in that you can sort it. It will all taste good, but if you sort it into, I guess we're kind of using the word buckets today. So these particular ducks, let's take off the skin and and the fat and let's cook it as a breast. These particular ducks are, you can't go wrong with them. So let's Let's pluck and cook them whole. So I guess you can tip the odds in your favor. But I really like the idea of trying to make it common, you know. And I think that's another thing, too, this modern civilization that we live in. People aren't programmed to look at something as a whole organism dead, right? They're programmed to look at it as a package at the supermarket. And so I do think there's a mental hurdle that people have to get over. And maybe it's not the person who chose to hunt. They've obviously chosen to get over that. But if they're going to bring that meat back home to the family, perhaps it is the family who has to get over that hurdle. And and the mind pictures things and it can influence, you know, how you receive things, how something tastes. And so sounds like a great tip there is to to make it normal, normalize that experience. Yeah. I mean, in one piece to this that we didn't mention is is uh, is shot holes. So if I if I roast, you know, four mallards for a dinner party, and we've got some squeamish people in the in the crowd, they're gonna they may not say anything, but they're gonna mentally note and be like, oh, about a shot hole in the breast of a of a of a duck. Now, of course, I only shoot ducks in the head, of so course. that never happens to me. <laughs> <laughs> But, but you get the point. Like, and this is another one like, okay, in terms of your, your, your buckets of, of uh, spend the time or not, did you set or pattern the wood duck? Then, yeah, you should probably skin it. Got it. You know, so it's, it's, you don't want to go through all that effort and then have 17 holes in the, in the breast of the bird. And you're like, oh, great. That was, just, that was a waste of time. Now, it's going to happen once in a while, but you get good at, at triaging like, okay, these are the special birds and these are not. Yeah, you know, I, and, and I really want to stress the importance of, of this discussion that we're talking about barriers, because I think when we're talk about, and, and I'm not pointing fingers anywhere, but I do think that out in the open, when we're talking about cooking wild game, our, our audience, Delta's audience, is typically, I don't know if we mean it or not, but if, it's almost like we're talking to the hunter who's been cooking their whole life, and we challenge them with a new way of cooking it, or... Or, hey, tired of the same old thing, cook this instead. But a lot of people in my travels have quit hunting. You know, they say, oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a biologist. I, you know, and they say, oh, I, I used to hunt, but I quit it because no one in my family eats it. And I have this story that tells a really, I don't understand it, but I understand that it exists. And I was in grad school and I was hunting on a national wildlife refuge west of Grand Forks, North Dakota. And it was me and my lab, Rudy. 
And we're sitting there. It was a beautiful morning. We harvested a few ducks. And all of a sudden, I hear some gunshots in the distance. And in soars a hen mallard. And she lands up in, up in a grass field about 150 yards from me. A few minutes go by, and I see a couple guys walking across in the grass. And I gave them a little bit of time to try to find it. They didn't have a dog. So Rudy and I trudged across the, the wetland up into the uplands. And I said, hey, guys, we'll help you find this. And sure enough, Rudy brought that hen mallard to hand. And this is the part that was confusing to me. I, I didn't grow up with it. I grabbed that duck, and the guy nearest to me, I stretched out my arm and said, here's your duck. He didn't grab it. He turned to his buddy and said, to his buddy, hey, buddy, do you want it? And the buddy doesn't reach out his hand. He looks at me and says, well, do you want to keep it? <laughs> and I said, one of you guys is taking this duck. Otherwise, why are you out here? And I don't know what their story was, but, you know, a long list of people do bring home game and give it away. And I'm okay with that, as long as someone is enjoying it. But if we can help people that are intimidated by it or or just don't know how to cook it, and that's why they give it away, those are the people that I hope are listening to this. Or someone who does hunt can tell this story to someone else and influence their life. Yeah, I mean, that story tells me, and I've met guys like that, where they're not hunting for food. They're, you know, they are hunting for camaraderie. They're hunting to hone their skills as a shotgunner. They're honing because all, all these other reasons. Like, so, you know, some of them may be hunting like that because in their past they've tried to cook the duck and it was terrible. Well, I don't know what to tell you, man. Just, you have to give it another, there's the information's out there, you know? I mean, in the, the short version of how to fix that fear if that's what you have is that do not think of ducks and geese as birds in the kitchen because they are not birds in the kitchen from a cook's perspective they're beef so a canada goose a crane uh, a mallard any kind of duck or goose the breast meat think of that as ribeye or a steak of any kind that you like it needs to be cooked exactly like you cook a steak which is to say no more than medium well. And most people enjoy waterfowl breast medium rare. The legs and the wings, you think of them as brisket. So they have to be cooked slow and low. So one of the misconceptions that so many people have is they have a duck and they've gone through the effort to pluck this duck. And it looks like a chicken, it's kind of. <laughs> and so they cook it like a chicken, kind of. And it's terrible. Because it's neither fish nor fowl in that case. So if you think about cooking, say, a mallard, a plucked mallard, exactly like a chicken, it's terrible. Because you've overcooked the breast, you've undercooked the legs. you got to go, you know, you got to do one or the other. you got to either cook it at an enormously high temperature for a very short time, with, to put numbers on it, 500 degrees for about 18 to 20 minutes for Holy a mallard. Cow. Or you have to slow roast it like they did in the old days. It, to where the juices run clear, the breast is horribly overcooked, but the legs are fantastic. And then the breast essentially becomes a vehicle for gravy. And that's also fine. Like, that's, that's, a, that's a thing, and people like it, and even I like it every once in a while. Um, so that one thing, to treat waterfowl like beef in the kitchen, breasts are steaks, legs and wings are like brisket, and that will... That, you could forget everything else in this podcast and that will help you a lot. Knowledge is power and wild game is fun. We want everybody to enjoy it. And I just want to be clear. I don't judge anyone if they give away their game. I think wild game is a wonderful gift. And when I clean something, whether it's an antelope or a deer or a duck and I give it to someone and it puts a smile on their face it makes me so happy, right? Because I'm connected to that and I'm sharing that connection with them. The only people I'll judge are the ones that throw it in a ditch or throw it in the garbage. That well, yeah, that deserves leader. that. But, you know, beyond that, we're, we're trying to help the open-minded um, find a way to please their own palate. So let's just pretend for a second here that we have everybody eating meat. Everybody listening to this podcast is eating meat. They're They're harvesting their game. They're cooking their game. Again, Check out Hank's website. Go buy any number of his cookbooks. But, Hank, I, I read in your bio on your website where you said that for quite a number of years, you 
don't buy meat? Or do you buy, what type of meat do you buy or how often? So since about 2005, which is getting on there these days, um, I haven't bought meat or fish but a handful of times. And the, the, what I will still buy are things that I can't hunt. So things like octopus, because I really like octopus. Um, it's fiendishly difficult to get shrimp. So I have some friends who are shrimpers, and, and they send me shrimp in once in a while. I have a couple of friends who are hog farmers, and I get, I get really good pork from these guys. Um, so that's kind of the extent of it. Um, life sucks without pork, so um, I'm not going to live without it. And, and the fact that I have friends who make who raise really amazing pigs that are so unbelievably better than any wild hog I've ever shot that it's kind of like put me off of hog hunting. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, if I got a buddy in Michigan, another buddy in Ohio who would just raise amazing pigs. And so, yeah, those, I, I still have a, a strong attraction to, but I don't, I don't buy beef. I don't buy lamb. I don't buy fish. Um, I don't buy, well, I bought a chicken, like I could kind of one hand the number of times I bought a chicken in the last 15 years. And that's because I wanted a really good, you know, like a Gucci chicken, uh, you know, one of those fancy ones you get at the <laughs> farmer's market. Uh, and because they're amazing, like a really good chicken is something to behold. And I think chicken gets a bad rap because, well, justifiably so, because industrial chicken is pretty piss poor. But a well-raised chicken is an amazing thing. But yeah, I mean, pretty much everything is is wild. So I think there's, I'd say most, I'm going to broad brush stereotype. I know the second I say this, I'm wrong, but I'd say most people don't have the time. Maybe they don't even have the desire to live off of wild meat 100% of the time. I'd say it's probably true. Most of them don't, but you've pursued that. Any tips for those types of people I'm assuming we, not everything who is... Who want to do it who don't want to do it? Oh, who want to do it? You know, how do you... You know, is it... You know, if you're making spaghetti, it's ground something? Or, or right. how do you mix... What are, uh, what are your number tips? Number one, shoot deer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, number one, shoot does. Um, you know, that like if you're trying to be meat sufficient, um, you know, fish pan fish, fish walleyes... Um, or, you know, you're the equivalent fish where you live. In, in my, where I live, it's a Pacific rockfish. Um, shoot deer and spend a lot of your winters in the marsh. Because one of the cool things about uh, duck hunting, especially where I live, we have a 107-day season and we're a wintering ground. So where I live, you focus on duck hunting when everything else is done. Now, that's not the case in the Dakotas. Right. But... If you, but I would say, hey, if you wanted to be meat sufficient, um, if you're just putting bulk in the freezer, deer, snogies, um, and then you know lots and lots of fish. Now the other piece to that is you're going to be sick of red meat very quickly. Now it's extremely important from a um, a desirability perspective to focus on the white meat species when you're not focusing on the dark meat species. So you have that balance. Um, so where you live is great because you've got, you know, you've got pheasants and you've got huns and, and, you know, farther south you've got quail. So the, and rabbits, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm just saying this because that's what I experienced. Uh, it was like, oh, it's pretty much all red meat all the time. And I kind of, that's when I would go buy a, a really nice chicken because I just needed a break. You just needed a break. So diversify. And again, with, <laughs> yes. with, a large percentage of the year, you're going to probably, for lack of time, if you have a busy lifestyle, normalizing the consumption of that, grinding some for spaghetti, for lasagna, mm-hmm. burger. It really isn't very hard if you think about it. I mean, it's really not. I mean, th- if you if you break it down to poundage, let's say you're you're a super red-blooded, chest-thumping American, right? Well, you're still not going to eat really more than a half a pound of meat a day. And even that you're probably not going to eat a half pound, but let's just say a half pound a day. That's a, you know, 130 some odd pounds of meat. That's not that much. That is not that much. If you think about it, right. It's, it's, this is what we found. Like when we started this experiment in 04 and 05, 
I was moving spreadsheets and I needed X amount of rabbits and blah, blah, blah. And like at some point, you, once you become a, a capable angler and a capable hunter, you're giving stuff away because you're like, uh, okay, I need to stop buck hunting because we're good. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I think so. So there's, there's you Hank and there's me too. I feel we're cut from the same cloth on that one, but then there's the people who, don't desire. They're not motivated by a hundred percent replacement of, of grocery store meat. And there's the one that, that puts a dozen ducks or a few up on game birds, or maybe a deer, they put it in their freezer. And so I, I, when I look at that type of person, I think that cooking a wild game is kind of like a honeymoon. It's an occasional treat. It's always good. And you put a lot of time into it. And I think that's a great opportunity to dip into a cookbook and challenge yourself. Try mm-hmm. to cook something. Try to outdo the last time you ate wild game. And, and it's always fun. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point because um, not necessarily outdo yourself in terms of extravagance, but I, I made a green chili stew yesterday with some Nilgai meat, which is basically like Actually, Nilgai are are bovid, so it's more like grass-fed beef than it is like deer, but let's just call it venison for the sake of argument. So green chili stew is from New Mexico, and it's very, very basic. There's not a lot of ingredients in it. And I think it's really useful and enjoying and satisfying for you to find a recipe that you like a lot and get good at the technique. So it's not necessarily about doing the more and more fancy stuff. It's about absolutely nailing a recipe that makes you happy. And that's going to require some time because think about this. While ground meat dishes are easy to nail because you can just grind anything and just use it. And then when you're practicing and you don't have game, you can use domestic meats. Now let's talk about venison tenderloin. You can't just go to the store and buy venison tenderloin. So... If you're going to try and nail a dish like that, that could be a a several years project. And to put it in the waterfowl world, it's not going to be often you're going to have a bunch of canvas backs. I mean, I I know a couple people who shoot lots of canvas backs, but mostly you're going to get like two, four, six, ten a year. And they're very special ducks. And so you're going to want to nail your skill with that particular duck. And that's going to take some time, but it's going to be exciting every time you get an opportunity. One of the things that I'm guessing you experience this, when I'm cooking wild game, my friends or my kids pull out that package and I can tell from the package which bird or which deer that is. And I grew up at the kitchen table. We would retell the story of that particular hunt and it, and it was a lot of fun. And so I, you're not going to get that from the grocery store either. That time that I went to the grocery store and I picked it out of the freezer or picked it out of the cooler, (laughs) that was awesome. So don't overlook that that aspect of it either. That is exactly why I use the phrase, my trophies at the table, because um, there's some really interesting philosophical essays about uh, wall mounts and skull mounts and things. And and the the gist of it is that uh, any kind of head on the wall or taxidermy or whatever has zero meaning unless somebody associated with that hunt is in the room. And... The, 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 the meaning of that meal grows exponentially when you can sit at that table and tell the story. So, yeah, absolutely. It's a big part of it. It is fun. I, I have a – I think I'm different than a lot of people. Well, okay, that's kind of stating the obvious if, if for people mm-hmm. that know me. But what I mean by that is that I live in a household. I have an awesome wife. My wife doesn't hunt. My wife also doesn't eat wild game. It's a, it's a mental thing. It's not taste. It's all mental. And she 100% owns it. She supports me going, supports my kids going. But in my household, I have certain strategies that I deploy to, to bring in wild game into my house. And so if we're grilling chicken breast for her, we're also grilling pheasant for me and, and the kids or venison for me and the kids or homemade jerky, or if we're making a chili, we have two pots, 
one with venison ground inside of it and the other one with hamburger. Wow. It, Are you serious? Yeah. She's that bad? Like, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, man. Like, there's zero pre- people who can tell the difference between beef chili and venison chili. And, and she'll consumer. say the same thing. It's mental. It's completely in her mind. Just switch it a bunch of times and then just have, then let her be faced with the fact that, yeah, yep, it's just as good. <laughs> That, that actually works. <laughs> and she I don't think she listens to the podcast, so I'm probably okay here. But it, early in our marriage, I harvested an elk and wonderful meat. And yeah, I did switch it a few times. And of course, there wasn't any feedback, but she didn't know it. And again, she'll own it. She'll just say, hey, I, I, it's just a mental thing for me. Go for it. Love it that you do it. Love that you're getting outdoors with the kids. And so lucky in that regard. Very much so. It's a hard one, though. You know, it's, it's, I guess everything has a challenge, but, uh, you know, we've really done a great job, uh, dealing with that one, telling the stories that that's all good. So we've covered a lot of great ground here, but I want to, I want people to, to have a great experience. And so I want to focus here. And I think we're kind of starting to see the, I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel for our discussion here, but what are some tips on, so, so you go out into the field, you harvest ducks. Between then and when they're in the freezer, what are, what are some ways that hunters go wrong? Or what are some game care tips, duck care tips in the field that you would give people? Of course, this depends on temperature, but in typical duck hunting temperatures, the biggest problem I see guys do is, they, is, the, is the big pile. Um, ducks are warm. Ducks hold heat and... When you have a big pile of ducks, you are conserving the heat within those ducks, and that can make them go off much quicker than if you just line them up. Or if you, you know, I've been in some blinds where you've got little notches where you can actually hang your ducks as you bring them into the blind. That's kind of the best of all worlds. But definitely do not throw them in a pile because they will stay warmer longer and they can go sour easier. So that's one. Um, I think... Another one, you know, I'm used to, to the problems of too warm weather. The problems of too cold weather is you, you need to keep your ducks from freezing. You know, you don't want them to be a solid block of duck when you come out of the field. So that's that's an issue where if it's that cold, then maybe you do want to pile them up. So What goes wrong when they freeze? Uh, well, you never want to freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw meat. So uh, what happens each time... Each time something that has been frozen thaws, f- the process of freezing breaks cell walls. And when it thaws, the cellular fluid leaks out. So whenever you've got thawed meat and you've got that pool of what you think is blood, it's not actually blood. It's just it's fluid from the cells. And uh, what that does is it makes the meat drier, drier and drier and drier. I mean, you can really tell this in fish. So never frozen fish versus previously frozen fish, and with some exceptions, um, is going to be infinitely moister. And the same thing is true with ducks. Like to the point where if you get the special ducks, like wood ducks or canvas backs or something like that, eat them before you have to freeze them, and you will notice a difference. I wouldn't have guessed that. You know, I, I, oh, it's noticeable. Yeah, I, I love cooking game in the field. You know, just super simple, either with salt and pepper mm-hmm. or nothing at all. But yeah, usually, yeah, a lot of the game that I bring home ends up in the freezer for, you know, extended periods of time. So that that's a good tip. I don't know. Now that's... a little a little side tip to that is, once you have your birds home, they can live in your fridge for a week. Like they'll be fine. I mean, if you think about the meat you buy in the supermarket, it's often ten to twelve, fourteen days old. Uh, so your uh, fresh, fresh game meat in the refrigerator will easily last a week. So you don't have to eat it that night or the night after. Because well, let's face it, if I've been duck hunting and cleaning ducks all day, the last thing I want to eat for, for dinner is duck. It's like, you know what we eat? when I, I work on a fishing boat in Alaska where we fish for salmon for 16 to 20 hours a day. The last thing I want to do is eat salmon on the boat. <laughs> so I get it, you know. Um, so, But you have some time. So give it a rest, 24, 48 hours, and then eat your, your nicely, nicely aged duck breast and have at it. But in terms of field care, ducks are pretty durable. I mean, it's they go off at a much slower rate than, say, quail or um, or pheasants do because typically, I mean, obviously you're the Dakotas, it's cold there, but it, early season upland game bird hunts are 
uh, all kinds of issues with that kind of field care. Ducks, a little bit less so. Um, I think another thing is if you are going to ultimately pluck some, try to keep them dry. Uh, I know it's sometimes impossible, but it's way easier to pluck a dry duck than a wet, than a sopping wet duck. Makes a better picture, too. Oh, yeah. If they're wet, they look so very dead. <laughs> yeah, they are, but they, they look even more dead. I, I agree I with you 100%. <laughs> So, hey, this is another kind of a comparative question here. Waterfowl, in terms of complexity. Now, you said that waterfowl are often the most abused form of of wild game meat. But in terms of difficulty, would you give them a higher difficulty score or would you put them or or would you put all game on a similar level? Mm -mm, I would make them easier, actually. You would? Yeah, much easier than upland game. Upland game is the trickiest. Because um, you're dealing with thinner skin, you're dealing with um, birds that can dry out much much easier, and with birds like pheasants and, and grouse and such, where you want them cooked through, but they can go from perfect to, to dry very easily. Whereas ducks, are, if you follow my rules, and you're cooking duck breasts like a steak, if you err on undercooking, this is another thing. This is the other thing that you need to remember in this podcast, other than that cook duck breasts like steak and duck legs and wings like brisket. Remember that you can always cook something more. You can't uncook something. It's like a haircut. So it, yes, it's exactly <laughs> like a haircut. And and that's the thing. Like People get all bunched up like, oh, I don't know if it's ready. Well, undercook it and cut it in half. And like, oh, it's not cooked enough. Put it back in the pan. You'll get better. I mean, it's it's cosmetic only at the in, in the initial stages, but you will enjoy and you'll be able to eat it. Whereas if you cooked a duck breast and and you let it go too long, there's your flying liver. Got it. Got it. Hey, you in your in your buck buck moose cookbook, you had the the finger test for mm-hmm. rare, Absolutely. medium rare. Uh, well done. So with a, Does with that work with ducks moose? too? Yeah, hundred percent. So with a, the, there's one caveat though. So if you're if you're talking about skinless duck or goose breast, it's exactly the same. Okay. However, if you've got the skin on, which I recommend for good birds, that skin gets crispy and, and hard, so it will mask how well that duck breast is cooked. So you have to do the finger test on the meat side. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that was that was amazing. I hadn't used that before. You know, I just so let's go through it so that for people who may not know it. Yeah. So everyone who's listening, hold out your hand and keep it kind of loose and then press with your other thing, hand the base of your thumb, that pad at the base of your thumb. And you feel how squishy it is. OK, now just touch your thumb and your forefinger together and press that same spot. You see, it's a little bit more firm. Yeah, that's rare meat. Loose is raw. Thumb to forefinger is rare. Thumb to middle finger is medium. Do not go past medium. Now, just for just for shits and giggles, go now. Touch your pinky to your thumb and press the same pad. See how hard that is? <laughs> yeah, that's I don't cat wanna, food. I don't want to eat that. Yes, that's cat food. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That's amazing, actually, because I you know I kind of grew up looking at it from the outside. So, you know, with a with a venison steak, you know, how do the juices look like coming out? What color, you know? And but I. I use that. Finger. Ultimately, you will be able to do this through the force. Like I could probably drink a fifth of Jim Beam and cook duck breast properly because I've done so many of them. <laughs> you know, we we have some nuggets here that have come out of this podcast, and this is certainly one of them. And uh, I, I appreciate that. This is a tip on how not to overcook your meat. Don't go past thumb to middle finger. Right. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Hank, I really appreciate the time here. I'm, I suspect that we've that we've generated a lot of questions that hopefully can go your way, Hank. Are you okay if people getting a hold of you with questions? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm very active on Instagram as Hunt Gather Cook. And uh, I have a Facebook group. It's a private group, so you have to answer questions to get in, but it's also called Hunt Gather Cook. And this group is, so this group and Instagram are where all the action really happens outside of the website. So uh, on the Facebook group, it's about 20,000 people uh, who are all united in their uh, desire to be better cooks of wild foods of all kinds. So we have everything from like vegetarian, you know, earth mother 
foragers to, you know, dually drive in guys who kill 20 deer a year. So, but, but and it is a no drama site called hunt, gather, cook on Facebook. And, um, just tell me that you heard, uh, about it through this podcast and I'll let you in. And then Instagram it's hunt, gather, cook. And those are the easiest ways to get a hold of me directly. Okay. I did. We, we should point out that the other leg of, of your pursuit is gathering. Do you want to mm-hmm. give a quick, I mean, I think that might pique some curiosity here. What, what are you referring to when you're referring to the gathering aspect? The number of times that I have saved a crappy day hunting or fishing from shore by finding something delicious that grows. So either plants or mushrooms. Uh, I can't even count on uh, any number of hands because the to me, that is the third leg of the stool. So fish is one, game is the other, and plants and mushrooms are the third. And there are so many wild edible plants and mushrooms that live in North America that that would be a whole topic in and of itself. But um, just the things that live in marshes. You know, there are there's a whole set of mushrooms that live in marshes that are edible that we don't have time to go into now. But but at least in California in the in the winter months, wild mustards everywhere, uh, wild nettles are everywhere. And so there's there's this great synergy between when you're hunting for the protein, you often have what else goes on the plate all around you. And that's pretty cool. I, I, th- I think so many people and I can relate to it a little bit is that so. If it's a duck or if it's a deer, you know that inherently that is safe. It's not going to poison you. But I think as soon as you jump into things that grow, I think that can be very intimidating because you're not sure if it's if it's safe to eat. And, and of course, the most obvious is berries. But if, even if you're talking about green things that grow, I think people will find that intimidating. And I'm guessing you can help break that down a little bit as well. It's only because you, you don't want to learn. Like it's not rocket science. I mean, this is, a, this is another one where everyone thinks it's so intimidating. And it is because for whatever reason in your life, you have become green blind. For you, a, a, a plant is a plant is a plant. A tree is a tree is a tree. And until you know the names of things, they can scare you. Um, when you know the names of things, then you start to see patterns. And human beings are extremely good at pattern recognition. And a, a great example is uh, hemlock. So one of the most deadly plants in the world grows everywhere. Everyone's like, oh, my God, the this or that or the other plant in the same family looks just like hemlock. I'm like, no, it doesn't. And, and let me give you six reasons why it doesn't. So it's it, it's one of those things where more than anything that we've been talking about today, you want another human. Because if you and I walked around a wildlife area near your house, and I don't care where you are, I and mean, I'm talking to the generic you right now, mm-hmm. I guarantee you I can find you at least a half a dozen edible wild plants, no problem. And, and I can show you what to look for, where they live, and when they're supposed to appear. Like one real quick example. There's a, a dark little blue-ish cluster of berries that uh, is everywhere in Sacramento right now. And if you didn't know better, you'd think, oh, those are elderberries, except there are no elderberries out right now. Elderberries show up in June, July, and August in this part of the world. So like, it's the wrong time of year. So there's, there's no way possible that it would be an elderberry. So it's just, you can just throw that out of your mind and, and in and of itself. And, and, and learning your plants and mushrooms are like that. Like if you saw something that looked like a morel, very popular edible mushroom, in August in North Dakota, there's zero chance that it's a morel. It's probably a stinkhorn, which is quasi edible and pretty gross. But if it's in April or May, yeah, that's the right month. So you imagine, uh, have you ever had, do you wear glasses at all? I do part-time. So if you've had, if anybody out there has had an eye test where it's like, is this lens better or that lens? So the, the process of learning this stuff is very much like that. It's layers. It's like an onion. You peel back layers of knowledge until you get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper to, you know, be safe and to understand the natural world. And it's, again, it is not rocket science. I could literally teach you a dozen plants on in a, in a two-hour walk, but the, the 
transmission of that knowledge is a little bit more difficult when it comes to writing an article or um, uh, or or even a video. I, I get it. You know, one thing that just keeps popping out in my head, Hank, is that wild game or wild plants. That's how this country was settled, and use it or lose it. I guess you know, and it, and it's so it's this resurgence of, I guess, tradition. No matter who you are, you got here somehow, generations ago at least, through hunting and gathering. So let's awaken mm-hmm. that within everyone. So yeah, and I'll just one last piece on that is that most of the people listening to this can identify ducks in the air. That is way harder than identifying edible wild plants. Okay. There you go. You gave us a gave us a benchmark, something to compare. Yeah. So there, if you can identify your ducks, wild plants are easy. So we're going to wrap up here, Hank, and and I'm going to give a quick little introduction into the next podcast before we say goodbye. But if anyone has questions about this particular podcast or others, or you want have something that you want us to cover here at Delta, you can email me at podcast at deltawaterfowl.org, and it'll get to me. The next episode that we're going to record is about spring snow geese or the conservation order, the the spring goose, snow goose season. We're going to talk about kind of two sides of the coin. Why did the conservation order come about? What is it that allowed us to have spring snow goose seasons? And then we're going to talk about how, you know, the mid-continent populations of snow geese are faring. But then the other side of the coin is hunting. We're going to talk about hunting. We're going to talk about some tips, tactics. So whether you're new to snow goose hunting or or a, or a vet, Hopefully you're going to learn something here and maybe that can be everyone's next adventure. So Hank, I, again, I can't thank you enough. Very, you know, you, you oozed of knowledge. That's usually not a word that someone would use as a compliment, but Ugh, for, I'm going to need a shower. After <laughs> you oozed, you reeked of knowledge. I, 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 I learned something and I think everyone else will as well. So again, Hank, I thank you very much. Appreciate the time. And you know, when it's, Eight below on Saturday, I'll be uh, envious of your, you know, 60, 70 degree temps in California. Oh, we're not quite at 70 yet, so. Oh, okay. Then I don't. There's that. (laughs) Then I'm not quite so jealous. But, Hank, uh, we'll cross paths here in the future, and thanks for your time. And everybody, check out Hank's website. Check out his cookbooks. It's it's quality material. You're going to learn a lot. Reach out for questions. Join his uh, Facebook group or subscribe to him on Instagram. Uh, you won't regret it. So again, Hank, thanks a lot. And uh, you take care. Yeah, you too. Thanks for having me on. Yes, sir. See ya. 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 Sir. See ya.